By golly, it's amazing. It sounds like something you'd hear on the radio. Presenting the transcription feature... The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. It's half past eight New York time. Time to wake up America and stump the expert. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. (laughs) And now, meet Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. It's the Bill Harris Alice Faye Show, presented transcribed by the makers of Rexall Drug Products. And now it's time to meet the men from the ministry. Forces Radio and Television Service presents the Bob Hope Show with Les Brown and his band of renown, and yours truly, Bill Goodwin. And now here he is, Bob Hope. Greetings, I'm Kevin Lauderdale. For a long time, science fiction on the radio meant Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon serials in the 1930s and 40s. Then came the 1950s and a spate of anthology science fiction radio shows that gave listeners a more grown-up half-hour drama or an adaptation of a famous science fiction short story. Tonight's entry is from one of the anthology shows. It's X-1, which ran from April of 1955 to January of 1958 on NBC. X-1 was actually a revival, or a reboot, of Dimension X, NBC's earlier science fiction anthology series, which ran from April of 1950 to September of 1951. X-1 used some of the same scripts as its predecessor at first, but soon branched out. Dimension X had 50 episodes. X-1 ended up with two and a half times that. This story, A Logic Named Joe, is based on the story of the same name by Murray Leinster. It appeared in the March 1946 issue of Astounding Science Fiction. The story tells what happens when a logic, essentially a computer, accesses all of the information in creation and allows every logic in the world to then not only answer any question it's asked, but to tell you exactly how to do anything. Not just calculate cube roots, but get away with murder. This adaptation sticks very closely to the original short story, And it's amazing how well Leinster predicted the home computer, the internet, and then the privacy, the concerns that come along with search engines like Google, and how much we depend upon them. As one of the characters in the story and the adaption here says, if we shut off the logics, we go back to a civilization that we've forgotten how to run. Could you do anything without a computer today? I chose this particular episode, at least in part, because of one of the bit players. I was listening to this when all of a sudden one of the characters, Mike, spoke, and pop, in my mind, I could visualize Lieutenant Carpenter from the TV sitcom McHale's Navy. Yep, Bob Hastings is in this. He later played Kelsey the bar owner in All in the Family. He got his start on radio and went on to do a lot of voiceover work, including the voice of Commissioner Gordon on Batman the Animated Series, the brilliant Warner Brothers animation which aired from 1992 to 1995. Funny how your mind fills in the things that are missing when you only get one part. I just heard that voice somewhere in my memory, but somewhere in my memory bank, it knew it. I could just visualize him speaking. This particular script had originally been performed on Dimension X in July of 1950, but here's the version from the reboot. From December 28th, 1955, X minus one, a logic named Joe. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the 
the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, A Logic Named Joe, by Murray Leinster. It was on the third day of August that Joe came off the assembly line. And on the fourth, Laureen came into town. And that afternoon, I saved civilization. Lorraine is a blonde I was crazy about once, and Joe is a new 1974 model logic that I've got stored away down in the cellar. And how do I save civilization? You're listening now to a voice from the future. The the voice of Frank Caldwell, head service man for the Logics Corporation, makers of the machine that does everything for you. Well, nearly everything anyway. The electronic logic. uh, In the year we speak, 1974, no modern home was complete without one. And the logic sets were working so well that life was soft indeed for repairman Frank Caldwell. That is, until that fatal day of August the 3rd, when suddenly the logics began doing everything for their users and doing it too well. On the 3rd of August, there wasn't much doing, and I'm hanging around the boss's office smoking up his cigars. Frank, there's a customer outside. Go take care of him, will you? Me? I'm a maintenance man. Mr. Korlanovich wants to have logics explained to him. Explained? Where's he been, on Mars? I just moved up from the backwoods someplace. Well, why don't you explain him? Well, I, I don't feel too well. You were okay half an hour ago. Are you the boss here or am I? Go on out there, will you? Okay, okay. Oh, Mr. Korlanovich? Good morning. My name is Caldwell. Can I help you? Oh, thank you, Mr. Caldwell. This is my little boy, Freddy. Hi, you jerk! Oh, <laughs> Freddy. How many times have I got to tell you not to kick people in the shin? Excuse it, please, Mr. Caldwell. Oh, sure, sure. Just a kid. I got a knife home can cut you into little pieces. Please, Freddy. Uh, uh, we'd like to buy a logic, Mr. Caldwell. The gentleman we spoke to first said he had to leave in a hurry. I'll fix him. Well, I understand that you're not acquainted with logics, Mr. Kolanovich. That's right. We just moved to the city. Uh-huh. My wife, uh, she saw everybody else had a logic, and... You know how women no, are. Oh, you bet. Well, you can't get along without a logic in this day and age, Mr. Kolanovich. Look, I got a snake. You want to see? Well, you shut that. Uh, now, about the logic. Here, I'll just plug in this one right here. Now, you see, the logic looks kind of like an old-fashioned television set. Only it's got keys instead of dials. Now, a lot of the keys are standard, like uh, the television stations, the news, the stock market quotes, and so on. Of course, if you want to talk to somebody... You just punch the number of his logic. It's, it's like making an old-fashioned phone call. But there can't be keys for everything. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, let, let, let's say that you want to ask a question, like uh, what to take for a sore throat, or uh, who won the American League pennant in 1911. You turn on the logic, then you just punch the question key and ask, like this. Who was the first president of the United States? George Washington. There, you see. But I already knew that. Well, of course. That, that was just a sample. Uh, I, I got a little store. Will it keep books for me? It will keep your books, record your contracts, serve as a filing system, and check up on what happened to your lawyer's last client. Anything. Hey, they're really something, these things. 10,000 services and information sources in one. Read our advertising. What I want to know, Mr. Caldwell, uh, how do these logics work? Of course. Now, you saw that big building across the street? Sure. Well, that's one of the relay tanks. You see, there are a dozen of them all around the country, and they're all hooked up together. And there's a data plate in one of those tanks for every fact in creation. Anything that you want to see or hear, you just punch for it, and the logic gives you the answer. Hey, listen, could I ask this thing how to make dart poison? How to make what? Dart poison, like in Africa. I could shoot the darts through my bean shooter. Maybe, I think maybe we'd better not get one of these things. Oh, no, 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 it's perfectly all right, Mr. Kolonovich. The logic won't tell you that. I bet it will. I'm going to try it. Hey, how do you make dart poison? Public policy forbids this service. Oh, what did you do that for? Kind of some little brat. Uh, because some people might ask things that aren't good for them. Listen.
listen. I don't like this here one. I want that one over there. Well, kid, they're all alike. I want that one. If I can't have that one, I'm going to hold my breath till I'm dead. Well, I got a lot of time. It's no use, Mr. Caldwell. You might as well give him the one he wants. But look, kid, they're so much alike that even I can't tell them apart. I can. I want Joe. Joe? Who's Joe? I guess he means the logic, Mr. Caldwell. He has to think up a name to call everything. You should hear some of the names he calls me. Not till I'm 21. I promised Mother. Okay, so we call him Joe. But them things are all alike to one ten thousandth of an inch. I don't care. I bet he'll teach me how to make dart poison. <sighs> okay, then. Come on, Joe. So he keeps yelling, I want that one. I want that one. I'm going to call him Joe. Mike, I tell you, I could have wrung his neck. How many cards? Uh, I'll draw two. What a holy terror. He had his father scared to death. It's too bad that kid ain't mine. I'd show him quick enough who was boss in the family. Uh oh, holy smoke. What's the matter? I'm sorry, fellas. I got to hold up the hand a minute. I just remembered. Oh, I got to call my wife. Oh, let her wait. You ever met my wife? Hey, what's the matter with this thing? It ain't getting my house. Announcing new and improved logic service. Hmm? Your logic is now equipped to give not only consultive, but directive advice. Hmm? If you want to do something and don't know how to do it, ask your logic. Hey, did you guys hear that? Well, they should have told us about this. Oh, it's just somebody trying to pull a gag. Well, it didn't sound like a gag to me. Uh, maybe the boss decided to add a new logic service. Look, the minute the system starts giving advice, some joker like you is going to be asking questions like, uh, how do I get rid of my wife? <laughs> oh, no. The boss knows better than to start anything like that. Yeah, but you heard what the logic just said. Oh, listen, the sensor circuits will block the question. If you don't believe me, go ahead and try it. Well, anything for a gag. Okay, logic, I got a question for you. How do I get rid of my wife? Service question. Is your wife blonde or brunette? You guys hear that? Uh, she's a blonde. Exicrylobinatine is a constituent of green shoe polish. Take home a frozen meal containing pea soup. Color the soup with green shoe polish. This poison is fatal to blonde females only. This fact is a product of logic service. You cannot be convicted of murder. It is improbable that you will be suspected. The saints preserve us. And it's bound to be right. These things can't make a mistake. Well, Mike, don't just stand there. Check the sensor circuits quick. Oh, we can't get to them. They're all sealed up. It's supposed to be impossible for them to go out of order. Well, they're out of order now. And I got a feeling that some awful things are going to happen. <laughs> Boss, we've got to do something. The logics have gone nuts. Now, relax. The thing gave a goofy answer once. Maybe it was a joke. But... It was an accident. Now, forget it. It won't happen again. What makes you so sure? People are going to be trying it. Look, look, supposing I wanted to get rid of you, for instance. You don't. How would you collect your pants? I know, but just supposing. Now, look, we'll try it. If you want to do something and don't know how, ask your logic. How do I bump off my boss? Male, fat, bald-headed, and 45. Uh. Make some chocolate ice cream containing powdered charcoal in place of half the chocolate. Use Hotso brand charcoal. Hotso contains an ingredient fatal only to fat, bald-headed males. This fact is a product of logic service. Uh, now, now, look, Frank, I admit these things have gone a little wacky, but there's nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about? If this keeps up, what do you bet that we'll have to shut down the company? You kidding? We can't shut down the company, and you know it. Logics have taken the place of everything but night baseball. We shut them down, we go back to a civilization that we've forgotten how to run. Yes, but, boss, there's no telling what they'll do. Listen, now, you've asked these questions for a gag. Nobody's going to ask them seriously. What you need is a little faith in human nature. Excuse me, it's probably my wife. Cyrus, dear, how do you feel? Why, just fine, sweetheart. What have you been doing? I just called to tell you, Cyrus. I've got your favorite dessert for dinner. Uh, 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 dessert? What kind? Homemade chocolate ice cream. Cyrus, when you taste it, you'll just die. 
Hmm? What's wrong? Uh, Why don't you answer me, Cyrus? What? Chocolate ice cream. Uh, 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 this, this can't be happening. Why, this, uh, this is awful. These logics are dangerous. Have a little faith in human nature. Now, Caldwell, you're the head of the maintenance crew. I'll give you 24 hours to fix these logics or you're fired. Well, now, look, boss. What are I you mean... standing there for? Get in the service car. Get moving. Where? Yeah. Anywhere. Find out what the logics are up to and see that you find out before the logics do. <laughs> Bartender, bartender, give me a double. Coming up. Last night, uh, have a little drink, pal. What's the matter, pal? You had a bad day? Oh, excuse me, bud. Listen, pal, you gotta listen. I got troubles. Bartender, will you get this bar fly off of me? On your way, son. Oh, don't, don't say that. I got troubles. How am I gonna keep my wife from finding out I had a couple of little drinks? How am I gonna do it, huh? Look, mister, it's a hot day, and I've been driving a car around in it, see? And I've been trying to keep a bank president from having apoplexy on account of his logic told him how to rob his own bank. I've been trying to stop six-year-olds from asking what comes after the bees and the flowers and their fathers from asking how to get a million dollars by tomorrow. I've been tripping over dead bodies so artistically croaked that nobody's ever gonna find out who done it, and all you got on your mind is how How am I gonna keep my wife from finding out I've been drinking? Dry up, will you? Go ask a logic. My pal, my boy, where's the logic? Uh, Where's that logic? Here, right behind you. Here, Uh, here's a nickel. That's what I gotta hear. Now, come on, logic, old pal. Old pal, be nice. How does a guy keep his wife from finding out he's had a couple of little drinks? Answer me that, huh? Buy a bottle of Franine hair shampoo. It is harmless, but contains an ingredient which instantly neutralizes alcohol. One teaspoonful for each jigger you have consumed. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Gotta buy a bottle of... Gotta buy a bottle of... Uh, What was that again? Supposing it's right, you'll never remember it as far as the drugstore. I think there's a bottle in the back room. Somebody left it. Oh, my pal. Oh, my boy. No more trouble. You'll just show me the way to go. <laughs> I got a picture of him back there drinking that shampoo. Yeah. Give me another double. Uh, I don't know what's worse, to be as low as you or as high as him. Where is he? I know he's here. Where is that bum? What do you want, lady? My husband. I know he's here. Where is he? Show me the way to go. That's him, that no-good louse. I'll show him. <laughs> Thinks he's coming home staggering again, does he? Well, I'll teach him. The poor guy. Why, my dear, what a surprise to see you here. Archibald, you're sober. Of course, my love. I'm sober as a judge. Then what are you doing in a saloon? Your suspicion wounds me deeply, my love. Let me tell you, my dear, that I have been conducting a research project that is going to make us a fortune. I'm going to patent soba, the drink that makes happy homes. Look at this blot I called, well, blank. The greatest crime wave in history, and we can't even make an arrest. They're all perfect crimes, thanks to the logics. But, Sergeant, we're doing our best to find well, out... Well, that's not good enough. You can't find out what's back of this. Shut down the company. Unless the police department will. Well, nobody is back of it. The logics run themselves. They pick their own circuits automatically. Ah, uh, you mean they're, they're doing all this by themselves? Sure. We always knew they could do a lot more things than than we knew about. I think they're just trying to be helpful, that's all. That's all, huh? Well, you better make them cut out the tricks, including this new business they're up to now. What new business? Just started an hour ago. Every time you turn on a logic, it asks your name, and then it spills out the whole history of your life. What? I haven't heard about that. What's it do that for? You tell me. Go on, go ahead, try it. Okay. What is your name? Why do you like that? I'm Frank Caldwell. Frank Caldwell. Were you ever called Ducky? Ducky? Wow. Lay off, will you, fella? What if I was? It's been years. Ducky, there is a call for you. Hello, Ducky. Holy cats. Lorraine. Ducky, darling, how marvelous. Hey, let me get a look. Gosh, Lorene, where are you? I'm in a hotel. I just got into town. Oh, Ducky, wasn't it smart of the logic to find you? The logic? To find me? I asked it how to find Ducky. You must have an unlisted number, darling. 
You're not in the directory. Well, uh, gee, uh, how have you been, Lorene, since, since I saw you last? I, I heard you got married. You won't believe me, Ducky, I know, but I've had four husbands, and I've never loved anybody as much as I love you. You've divorced four husbands? Three. The last one, um, died unexpectedly. Oh, who unexpected it? He did. But the jury acquitted me, Ducky. They knew it was just a little old accident. So now I'm free again. And we got lots of things to talk over. You come right on over here, Ducky. In. Oh, well, Lorraine, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working, you see, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll call you back. All right. Here's a kiss. <laughs> That'll have to hold you till you get here. Hurry. Oh, my back. What am I going to do? <laughs> do like you were telling me a while ago. Huh? <laughs> Calm yourself, ducky. Call on the logic for you, Frank, your wife. Oh, thanks, Mike. Hi, Gerd. I've been out making calls, honey, trying to find out what ails these logics. Well, you better find out in a hurry or there's going to be trouble. Now, now, look good. Now, just take it easy, I huh? Called, well, you can't let this happen to me. They're asking everybody's name. And when you tell your name, it reels off your whole history. Well, honey, I don't think they're doing that anymore. I think that was just, just temporary. Well, in the meantime, it's told everybody in the neighborhood all about me. I punched Mrs. Hudson's name. She's been married three times, and she's had Mr. Hudson arrested twice for non-support and once for beating her up. It'll tell anybody anything. Yeah, but look good. I'll tell you. Oh, honey, you don't mean that. I do. If you can't figure out how to keep our private lives out of every logic in town, then I'm through, and that settles it. I can't even budge any of these relay plates. Yeah, me either. Isn't there some way we can disconnect them? Nope, there is not. They weren't built to be disconnected. The sensor circuits were supposed to take care of cutting them off. Now, see who that's for, Frank. Hello, Ducky, darling. Oh, Lorene, not again. Ducky, darling, I'm so lonesome. Why haven't you come over? Well, I... I've been busy. Oh, poor Ducky. Look, let's get married. Gosh, Lorene, I... Well, what I mean is... Right away, Ducky. You're not busy tonight, are you? Look, Lorene, I got married. Oh, poor boy, my poor Ducky. Well, we'll just get you out of that. No, 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 no. Look, Lorene. It's all arranged, darling. I'll just call up your wife and have a little talk. No, now, please, Lorene. I mean, it's nice of you to think of me and all, but I... Yeah, you, you just give me your address and your logic number, darling. I, I haven't got one. Never mind, darling. The logic will find out for me. Lorene. Lorene? Hey, Frank, will you get away from that thing and give me a hand? Yes, Mike, in a minute. First, I've got to call my wife. No. We've got to get out of town. Oh, Lord, I made a, uh, a mistake. Frank, you're supposed to be helping Mike. Yeah, I am, boss. I am, but I've got to make this call. Call? What do I care about your call? The president's getting ready to close down the company and declare martial law. Now, for the love of heaven, do something. Yes, boss, I will. I will. I've just got to make this one call before the logics get on my trail. To assist in solving a special problem of logic service, kindly give the following information if possible. Where does Frank Caldwell live? They got me. I'm through. <laughs> Look, Gert, will you please not ask any more questions? Frank Caldwell, I told you I was leaving you. Honey, leave me later. Right now, will you pack up yourself and the kids? we got to get out of here. But what is all this? Uh, are the cops after you or something? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it, the cops. Now, get moving, honey, will you? And will you get away from that logic? Uh, but don't you think we ought to hear the police call? 27 and car 31. Detailed to round up all employees of the logics company. Use caution. They are suspected of sedition. Holy smoke, the cops are after me. But you just uh, said 17. they were. Car 17, proceed to vicinity of 119 East 7th Street. Child terrorizing neighborhood. Use extreme caution. Child is armed with bean shooter using poison darts. Freddy. Who's Freddy? Something I met once in a horrible nightmare. He wanted a logic that would tell him how to make dart poison. They're all alike, I kept telling him. They're all alike. What are you talking about? Oh, I don't know, Gert. All I know is it was a nice world up to yesterday. 
No, it's, it's, it's like a guy named Joe come along and squashed all our mud pies for us. Looks to me like, more like it was a logic named Joe. What? What'd you say? A logic named Joe. A logic name? But they're all alike. The... Good, good baby. <laughs> Frank, Frank, let me go. Don't be so silly. All right, honey, look, you hold the fort. Maybe they aren't all alike. So where are you going? Frank, are you going to make a getaway? Getaway, baby, if you've got the right inspiration, I'm going straight to the middle of this whole jamboree. Yes? Oh. I was hoping it was the police. You remember me, Mr. Kolanovich? Caldwell of the Logics Company? Logics Company? I wish the Logics Company was at the bottom of the ocean. I don't blame you, believe me. Now, where's your logic? In here. I'd smash it into a million pieces if... I wasn't afraid of what Freddy would do to All me. Right, look, just, just get out of the way, will you? I've got business with Joe. If you want to do something and don't know how, ask your logic. Oh, we're back to that routine, hmm? Well, I want to do something, all right. Can a logic be modified to achieve correlations for which human brains are too limited? Yes. How great will the modifications be? Microscopically slight. Changes in dimension not detectable even by precision gauges. They can come about only through an extremely improbable accident. And what would this super logic then be able to do? Come on, you, spill it. It could set up entire new combinations of electronic relays, which would bypass the normal sensor blocks, uh-huh. thereby enabling it to perform valuable new services, including the giving of helpful advice on any human problem. Uh Uh-huh. And has this accident ever happened? Come on, come on. It has happened only once in the case of the logic now owned by the Kolonovich family of 119 East 7th Street. A logic named Joe... Thanks, Joe. That's all I wanted to know. Hey, what's all that about? I'm taking this logic away, Mr. Kolonovich. I'll bring you a new one, and our troubles are all over. Hey, you, get away from Joe. Correction, our troubles are just beginning. Freddy, put down that blow gun. Ah, oh, shut up. Hey, you, I said get away from the logic. Look, look, Freddy, I'm going to bring you a nice new one, see? I want that one. Get your mitts off it. But I got Miss Bean Shooter ate lemonade. Mr. Caldwell? Mr. Caldwell, the police, they're outside. Yeah, for me and Freddy... Nuts. What they want you for? You ain't smart enough to do nothing. Oh, no? Hey, there's plenty I could tell you. There's the cops, kid. It's you and me against them. So what you gonna do about it if you're so smart? Now, look, we may have to fight our way out. Let me see that blowgun. I know a way to hop it up so the cops won't have a chance. Now, come on, come on, give it to me. Okay, let's see what you can do. Here. Thanks. Here! Oh! oh. Mr. Caldwell... You're a great man. Now, all I got left to do is pull this plug out of the wall. Come right in, Sergeant. Well, that must be the kid. He don't look so tough to me. Well, he just got a little softening. There'll be no more complaints, officer. I guess I can go on where Mr. Caldwell left off. Caldwell? Hey, you wanted... Now, look, I just came to pick up this busted logic. I don't know a thing. You said that before. Come on, you're going to the cooler. Let's go. Now, wait a minute. You act like you wanted to go to jail. Well, just till a certain party leaves town. I, uh, get a feeling it's safer. Okay, then, Caldwell, into the paddy wagon you go. Thanks, officer. You may be saving my life. Now, if you'll just help me carry this logic out... Wait a minute. You, uh, you can't take that in the wagon. I can't? Why not? There's no room. We already got a dame in there who's raising the roof. A dame? Yeah, a blonde. Plain clothesman picked her up trying to buy a gun without a permit. She keeps screaming she's gonna... Miss her date with the ducky. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you A Logic Named Joe, 
Adapted for radio by Clarice Ross from the story by Murray Leinster. Featured in the cast were Mandel Kramer, Wendell Holmes, Guy Rep, Bill Zuckert, Walter Kinsella, Bob Hastings, Joseph Julian, Joey Fallon, Mary Lou Forster, Ann Thomas, and Mary Patton. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Next week, X-1 will bring you a dramatization of Robert Heinlein's famous science fiction masterpiece, The Roads Must Roll. It concerns the day when traffic became so impossible that the engineers took over and banned all automobiles, tore up the superhighways, and built huge mechanized roads which whirled along on giant rotors at speeds up to 100 miles an hour. An engineering miracle changed the face of the nation. The rolling roads took over. No one worried about the fact that if the road should stop, our whole economic life would fall apart. The machinery, they said, was perfect. But they forgot that machinery depends on men, and men are not perfect. Be sure to tune in next week at a new time, same day, for another exciting broadcast of X-1. Probably the most famous radio quiz show ever was You Bet Your Life, which, over its 13-year run from 1947 to 1960, was on ABC... CBS, and finally NBC. What gave the show such staying power was its host, the one, the only, Groucho Marx. The quiz portion of the program was actually a very small component. People tuned in to hear Groucho interview the contestants. These were couples, usually a man and a woman, strangers to each other, and most often selected from the studio audience. As Groucho talked to them about their lives and professions, should they happen to say the secret word of the day, they could also earn a little money. These were everyday, ordinary words, something you'd find around the house. Groucho was able to draw the contestants out into outlandish discussions and find humor in even the most mundane of topics. This particular episode has some of the very best wordplay. Groucho was truly at the top of his game when this was going on. You Bet Your Life, from March 22nd, 1950, the secret word is money. Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is money. M-O-N-E-Y. Really? You bet your life! The DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America present Groucho Marx in You Bet Your Life, the comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood. And here he is, the one, the only... Don't be afraid, he's harmless. Hey, that's me, Groucho Marx! Thank you, thank you. Well, here I am again with $1,500 for one of our couples tonight. George Fenneman, who gets first whack at us? We invited some railroad conductors and some longshoremen to the show tonight, and just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected conductor Carl Putt and longshoreman Clarence Blake. Gentlemen, meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, gents, to You Bet Your Life. And if either of you says the DeSoto Plymouth secret word, he wins $100 in cash instantly. It's a common word, something you use every day. A conductor and a longshoreman, eh? Uh, conductor, where are you from? Uh, originally from Des Moines, Iowa. Tell me, who do you conduct for, the Los Angeles Philharmonic? <laughs> I'm a conductor for the Union Pacific Railroad. What train do you work on? Uh, city of Los Angeles. Uh, where do you go on your train? I handle a run from uh, Los Angeles to Las Vegas, Nevada. The city of Los Angeles goes to Las Vegas? <laughs> the city of Los Angeles goes all the way to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Must leave an awful big hole between Glendale and Long Beach. <laughs> well, that's where the city was yesterday. I've been looking for it. Longshoreman uh, Blake is your name? Uh, where, where are you from? Uh, uh, originally from Rome, New York. How, how long a uh, showman are you, Mr. Blake? <laughs> I don't think I know what you mean. 
Well, frankly, I don't know what I mean either. <laughs> Let's have another go at it, huh? <laughs> How long do you have to be to be a longshoreman? Uh, oh, not very, very much. You mean size has nothing to do with it, huh? Okay. Then you could be a short longshoreman, huh? Of course, though. Longshoreman, where, where do you work? Uh, down in San Pedro. And, uh, where in San Pedro do you work? On the docks. <laughs> I thought the docks worked on each other. Huh? <laughs> what made you decide to become a longshoreman? Was it an urge to do uh, uplifting work? Or? No, uh, I believe I love I loved the water. Get that in the bathtub. You, know. <laughs> you like the ocean, huh? Yes, like, I do. Uh, if you like the sea, why aren't you a sailor instead of a landlubber? Huh? Well, that's not a very good way to raise a family. That's not necessarily true. Fish manage pretty well. Huh? <laughs> How far out to sea do you, do you get as a longshoreman? Huh? Oh, about 25 feet. <laughs> Clarence, your anchor is dragging. Huh? <laughs> Now tell me, whistle stop. <laughs> what are your duties as a, as a conductor? Well, to uh, collect the tickets, see that the space is properly assigned, and to maintain the schedule. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought the engineer maintained the schedule. No, uh, I'm the head of the train. I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> You're the cow catcher, in other words. <laughs> well, let's take an average day. What's the first thing you do when you report for work in the morning? Uh, compare your watch with a standard clock, and uh, you check against inferior and superior trains. Well, how do you tell an inferior train? Is it uh, come from the wrong side of the tracks? <laughs> what time does your train stop at San Uh, uh <laughs> In which direction? Going along the track. Uh, <laughs> isn't that the customary direction? Well, I mean, uh, going east or west. It doesn't make any difference. East is east and west is west. <laughs> and never the train shall meet. <laughs> well, tell me, conductor, what was your most unusual experience uh, on your train? Well, uh, perhaps the most unusual was uh, having babies arrive while en route. You had a baby on the road? Well, yes, I've uh, had two or three. <laughs> well, was it an upper or a lower birth? <laughs> well, tell me, uh, did you throw the kid off because he didn't have a ticket? Or... <laughs> no, the new arrival and the mother was put off at the first stop for hospitalization. Oh, I see. That was probably the first time your train ever had an arrival ahead of schedule. <laughs> now, incidentally, suppose you're racing along and the stalk decides to make a landing on your caboose and you have to stop the train. How do you instruct the engineer? We have a system of uh, whistle signals. I have a whistle signal, too, but no one stops for it. Right? <laughs> uh, well, one whistle, when running, means... Uh, Look to your orders. Well, what do, you, do you stick your head out the window and whistle? Or? No, we have a system of air whistles within the train. You pull a cord. Okay, well, what's two, what's two whistles? Two whistles when standing means to start. Two whistles when running is stop the train at once. You Three want to throw the kid off, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and what, what's the next one? Three whistles. Three whistles when standing is back the train. Three whistles when running is stop at the next station. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me like you're always on a toot on that train. <laughs> How do you get the train started again? Uh, we give the engineer a highball. <laughs> no wonder you're always on a toot, huh? <laughs> what time does your train stop at San Badu? Uh, yesterday it was uh, 721 westbound and 621 eastbound. I don't know what it is today. Oh. Well, as soon as it stops, will you signal for a highball for me? <laughs> now that I know all about railroads and longshoremen, you're going to get your chance to win a lot of money, you bet your life.
car owners all over the country are familiar with the sign of an authorized DeSoto Plymouth dealer. There are more than 3,000 of these signs from one end of this nation to the other. And each and every one of them is a cordial invitation to you to come in and get acquainted. These dealers are certain that once they have a chance to serve you, you'll come back whenever you need service for your car. The folks at a DeSoto Plymouth dealers will do their utmost to treat you fairly and squarely. That's their creed. It will pay you to give them a chance to show you what good service really means. So drive in next time you see the sign of an authorized DeSoto Plymouth dealer. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth. Now let's see if you two will get a chance at the $1,500. Fenneman, tell them the rules. Each of our three couples has $20. They bet as much of that 20 as they want on each of four questions. The couple that earns the most money gets a chance at the DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question at the end of the show. Our other two couples are in a waiting room off stage, so they don't know what's happening out here. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected farm animals and birds as your category. Is that right? Now you got $20. Here's your first question. How much will you bet? $10. What kind of a farm animal is an Aberdeen Angus? Cow. A cow is right. <laughs> a great start with $30. You conductor, you've been looking out the window. That's <laughs> All right, now you got $30. What, uh, how much are you going to bet? 20. $20. $20. What kind of a farm animal is a percheron? It's a horse. It's a horse, is right. They're climbing, they have $50. You stevedore, you've been loading horses, haven't you? <laughs> All right, now you got $50. Here's your third question. How much of the 50 will you try? 40 40 $40. What kind of a farm animal is a Toggenberg? T-O-G-G-E-N-B-U-R-G. I think it's a goat. A goat is right. <laughs> They're really climbing now. They have ninety dollars. So how much of the ninety are you going to try? Fifty. Fifty is right. Fifty dollars. What is a pole in China? Pig. Pig. A pig is right. And they wind up with one hundred and forty dollars. <laughs> Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Don't run away now. You might get a chance at the big question. Groucho, the secret word is still money. Perhaps the next couple will say it. Just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected a housewife and a gardener, and here they are. Mrs. Sarah Pinola and Mr. Arthur Anders meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, welcome, folks, for the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. And if one of you says the secret word while we're talking, he wins $100 in cash. It's a common word, something you use every day. A housewife and a gardener, eh? Uh, Mr., uh, what is it, Anders? I presume you're the gentleman who does the gardening. Yes, sir. Are, are you married? Yes. Since you're a gardener, I'll bet I know what pet name you call your wife. Something you grow in your garden, it begins with a P. You know what I'm thinking of? Mm -hmm. Petunia? <laughs> no, I was thinking of pumpkin. <laughs> but you know your wife better than I do. By the way, what's your... <laughs> By the way, what's your, what's your wife's first name? Peggy. No, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> what, what's your hometown, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Panola? Racine, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. What sort of work does your husband do? Uh, he works for Los Angeles Transit Line, a bus driver. Mm -hmm. uh, how'd you meet him? I met him in a shooting gallery where I was working. <laughs> was he half shot at the time? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, oh. he was very happy when he walked in. Oh. <laughs> how was he when he left? Huh? What do you mean he was at? What were you doing at the shooting gallery? I was working. Uh, were you one of the clay I pigeons? I was loading or? up... No. <laughs> I was loading up the guns and oh. taking their money. <laughs> Sarah, you just said money, and that's tonight's secret word, so you just won $100 in cash. Compliments of the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America. I bet you think money really grows on trees, oh. huh? <laughs> now, what were we discussing before you shook that money tree, huh? How I met my husband. <laughs> oh, yes. You were loaded in the gallery. Huh? <laughs> what was your husband doing there? Uh, he was taking an evening stroll. And Through a shooting gallery? <laughs> no, he passed the shooting gallery. Uh-huh. So he saw a girl working there, which was me. And he thought, well, he was going to have some fun. He's pretty shrewd, isn't he, huh? <laughs> the minute he saw you, he said, that's a girl, huh? <laughs> You can't fool old man Panola. He knows you. 
<laughs> so? So he wanted to fool me, and he says, uh, I bet I can outshoot you. But he didn't know what was coming. I says, okay. I says, see if you can outshoot me. So we, he shot about... Is this verbatim? <laughs> <laughs> he bought about $5 worth of shots. It, he take one round, and I take one round. And I kept beating him. He said, oh, he was mad. He put his hands in his pocket. He walked out. He was real mad. Then the next night he comes, I outshot him again. That went on for about a week. Well, he didn't spend Well, how much, much did he spend by that time? No, he, he must have spent about $35 that week. Well, he was single. He could afford it. <laughs> so, by this time, you were beginning to suspect that... Uh, yeah, so I said, oh, there's, there's more to it than that. So he, more to, There's more to it than meets the bull's eye, you say. <laughs> he says, I'm taking you out. He says, I'm going to show you. He says, if you can outshoot me on live game, he says, I'll marry you. I kind of a curious time. proposal, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we went. And I couldn't shoot at you all. You went where? Where'd you we go? We went hunting. Uh, it's in pheasant country up in Wisconsin. Oh. So we went hunting pheasants. And I'm ashamed to say I couldn't shoot a live game. Boy, he was good, though. He could shoot. <laughs> <laughs> but he says, I won't break your heart, honey. He says, I'll marry you anyway. <laughs> and did you love him by this time? Oh, yeah. I liked him quite a bit. Uh-huh. <laughs> how, how old were you when, when all this happened, when you got married? Fifteen. Fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's hard to shoot a pheasant when you're 15, I guess. <laughs> now, tell me, uh, Mr. Anders, are you, you're still here, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Thought maybe you'd gone to seed. Uh... <laughs> as, as a gardener, uh, whom do you work for, uh, Mr. Anders? I work for myself. You're in business for yourself, man. Yeah. Developed your business by running it into the ground, eh? <laughs> now tell us, Chris, uh, that, that's short for chrysanthemum. Uh, <laughs> do you know how to spell chrysanthemum? Well, it's C-H-R. Well, you don't have to know how to spell them. <laughs> Mr. Anders, I'm aware of that, but uh, <laughs> where's your factory? On Flower Street? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't have a factory. Fine gardener. Doesn't even have a plant, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, what do you do in your job? Oh, mow lawns, put in sprinkling systems, I cultivate plants. Why you mow lawn, huh? <laughs> <laughs> have you planted anything in your garden lately, Sarah? Yeah, um... I saw a cactus by some people we know, and I liked it, so I dug it out of their yard and made a hole in mine and put it in there. <laughs> Where were the people? They were home. <laughs> well, how did you plan it? You just dig a hole and I stick it in I just dug a hole and put it in there. I said, either it grows or it dies. So I don't know. <laughs> Sarah, that's a pretty cynical attitude. Uh, <laughs> Was she doing it the proper way, uh, Mr. Anders? Well, that's about right. It doesn't take too much knowledge to raise a cactus. <laughs> I guess the big trick is stealing the plant, huh? <laughs> Are any flowers blooming this early in the year, Mr. Anders? Well, there's quite a few early bloomers. On the stand. <laughs> you mean on a windy day, huh? Say there are quite a few uh, early bloomers. Do you ever find any ants in those early bloomers? <laughs> this has been all been very educational, Mr. Anders, and you too, Sarah. Now let's see if a gardener and a housewife will get the chance at the DeSoto Plymouth fifteen hundred dollar question. You run your twenty dollars into more than the other couples, and you get the chance. I can't tell you how much the first couple won, but Fenneman is off stage to remind our listeners. The conductor and the longshoreman earned $140. You ready? Here we go. Let's see how high you can build your $20. You selected songs about the weather. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, how much of the 20 are you going to try? Ten. Give me the title of this weather song. Play, Jerry. <laughs> Talk right up now. Let it, let it snow. The lady says let it snow. <laughs> $20, Groucho. So how much of the 30 will you try? 20. 
What is the name of this song? Okay, Jerry. What April showers. April showers. They're quite a $50. Now you got $50. Here's your third question. How much of the 50 will you bet? $40. $40? Yeah, is that all right 40. with you? Here we go. Play it, Jerry. We're having a heat wave. We're having a heat wave. Now they have $90. All right, you've zoomed up to 90 bucks. Here's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much of the 90? 80 $80. $80. Give me the title of this song. Play, Jerry. Stormy weather. Stormy weather. Wind up with one hundred and seventy dollars. Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Now we'll soon know who gets the chance at the fifteen hundred dollar question. Fenneman, who's ahead? Well, the housewife and the gardener are leading with a hundred seventy dollars, and the secret word is still money. Just before we went in the air, our studio audience selected Miss Margot Heister, a ten cent store clerk. And Mr. J.C. Solomon, a diamond merchant. And here they are. Folks, meet Groucho Marx. Welcome for the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. And if one of you says the secret word, he wins $100 instantly. It's a common word, something you use every day. Solomon, huh? Eh? Right. J.C. Solomon, huh? Eh? You're the diamond merchant, huh? Eh? Right. Where are you from, uh, J.C.? Chicago. Thought maybe you'd be a stone's throw from Los Angeles, huh? since you're in the diamond business, huh? That's right. <laughs> you're from the Miss Heister? You're from the Ten Cent store? Yes, I am. Which one? Huh? Chris on Hollywood Boulevard. Pretty fair-looking dish to be in Ten Cent. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what's your hometown, uh, Margot? Sun Valley. Sun Valley, Idaho? Are you a good skier? No. You never did any skiing? No. Then? That's the way it goes. Huh? <laughs> People in Brazil never drink coffee. Huh? <laughs> People here can't afford it, huh? <laughs> uh, are you married, Margot? Yes, I am. Well, let's talk about diamonds, huh? <laughs> Tell me, uh, J.C., do you ever hand out samples? I never hand out samples. You don't give any diamonds don't away, don't give huh? diamonds away. Haven't you ever given just a tiny little diamond to a beautiful girl? Yes, I did once. <laughs> You slippery old dog, you. <laughs> Did you ever see that girl again? Yes, I do. I married her. Was that to get the diamond back? <laughs> do you handle anything besides diamonds, uh, Mr. Solomon? Yes, I do. Rubies, sapphires, emeralds. Precious stone once cost me 500 bucks. Did I get uh, gypped? Well, what kind of a stone did you buy? I didn't buy any. The doctor didn't say he charged me $500 for removing it. <laughs> what, what are the semi-precious stones? Well, they are opals, tourmalines, aquamarines. I thought that's something you found under your house. <laughs> aquamarines. What color are opals? Opals are a variety of colors. Every color under the sun is an opal. That isn't true. Opals are only pink. I watched her hanging them on the line only this morning. Huh? <laughs> Which is the most valuable of all the stones, Mr. Solomon? I should judge a diamond is about the most valuable stone. Why, why are they so expensive? Is such because a big demand? Because they are in demand. They are in demand. Well, it certainly is at my house, I know. <laughs> we don't have any diamonds at my house, but there's certainly a big demand for them. <laughs> How much do you charge for the average diamond? Well, they run anywhere from $50 to $3,500 per carat. It's a lot of money for a carat. <laughs> I don't see how those rabbits can afford them. <laughs> I think I'd better get back to figures I'm more accustomed to. Uh, hello, uh, Margot. How are you? Huh? <laughs> what kind of rings are in greatest demand at your store? Well, I think I'd say engagement and wedding rings. I know a certain gardener who bought one of your rings. Maybe that's why he's got a green thumb now. <laughs> you sell diamonds and emeralds and rubies in your dime store? Yes, we do. Hundreds of them every day. You do? Uh, how much would you charge me for a diamond bracelet? A little one. Then. Various prices. It's according to quality, up to a dollar. <laughs> well, that's very reasonable, Mr. Solomon. How can you have the nerve to charge thousands of dollars? <laughs> For a diamond when Margot here sells them for a buck. Well, she sells you pure 
crystal glass. Do you have any stones that would look good on me? Oh, yes, I have a very nice stone that will look good on you. <laughs> no, I wasn't referring to a tombstone. <laughs> I think I'll stick to Opal. She's more on my line. <laughs> Well, I learned a lot tonight, uh, from you two, about dime store diamonds. Now you're going to try for a chance at the $1,500 question. You beat our other two couples, and you win the chance at all that money. I can't tell you how much the other two couples won, but Fenneman's going to remind our listeners. The housewife and the gardener are ahead with $170. Here we go. Let's see how high you can build you $20. You selected nicknames of cities as your category. Is that right? You have $20. How much are you going to try and talk right out loud into the microphone? Ten. What city is called the biggest little city in the world? The biggest little city in the world. Uh, Take a guess. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's Reno. Remember, you're going for $1,500 tonight. Now, how much of the time will you try? I'll try five. Five? What city is called the Mile High City? No, the Mile High City is the uh, Big Bear Lake. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. You, you, you had the right altitude, but the wrong town. <laughs> it's Denver. They have five dollars, Groucho. How much are you going to bet? Three. Three. <laughs> what city is called the city of brotherly love? <laughs> well, now you're down to two dollars. It was Philadelphia. Oh, might as well. It was Philadelphia. Should have known that from cream cheese. Now you're down to two dollars. <laughs> Okay, here's your last chance to beat the other couple. Yeah. <laughs> if you can beat the other couples with two dollars, Mr. Solomon, yeah. you're a pretty shrewd cookie. <laughs> you know how much you're going to bet? All of it. All of it? <laughs> now, let's not go mad here. Right? How about a dollar ninety, Mark? <laughs> Make it the whole two dollars. The whole two dollars? Which, uh, what city is called the Windy City? Chicago. Chicago! <laughs> and they wind up with four dollars. Well, now, wait a minute. I don't want you to crawl away from here with only four dollars. I'm going to give you one more question. You get it right, and you're going to win ten dollars. Remember, no coaching, please. Are you ready? Okay, now, put your thinking cap on. <laughs> Who is buried in Grant's tomb? <laughs> General Grant, Margot got it. But they won $4. And that means the housewife and the gardener get the chance to DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question. You get the best equipment and the best workmanship whenever you take your car for service to an authorized DeSoto Plymouth dealer. You get the benefit of factory designed and approved tools and equipment. In addition, skilled mechanics who know how to use this equipment are sure you of getting a better job done on your car in shorter time. This, of course, means money in your pocket. This also means a car that will serve you faithfully and economically mile after mile. So next time your car needs service, Remember to stop in and get acquainted with a DeSoto Plymouth dealer. Learn what so many car owners all over this country already know, that it pays to stop in at the sign of an authorized DeSoto Plymouth dealer. And here is the housewife and the gardener, the winning couple, all ready for the DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question, Groucho. All right, you ready, Sarah? <coughs> yeah. Get your gun ready? <laughs> Here we go for $1,500. Ready? I'll give you 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you, so think carefully and please, no help in the audience. The Earl of Beaconsfield was Prime Minister of England in the 60s, and under his statesmanship, Britain grew to her greatest glory. What was the name of the Earl of Beaconsfield? the answer you two have decided upon? Tesla? No, no, it was, it was Disraeli. Oh. Benjamin Disraeli. 
I'm sorry. The correct answer is Benjamin Disraeli. So that means the big question next week will be worth two thousand dollars. Well, you lost the big money, but you won hundred and seventy dollars in cash plus a hundred dollars for saying the secret word. Congratulations and thanks to both of you. <laughs> You Bet Your Life is a John Goodell production, transcribed from Hollywood, directed by Robert Dwan and Bernie Smith. Music by Jerry Fielding. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at this time for the Groucho Marx Show, You Bet Your Life, presented by the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers of America. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth, two great cars, both products of the Chrysler Corporation. And don't forget, next week the big question will be worth $2,000. Folks, be sure to see the article about Groucho and You Bet Your Life in the current issue of Look Magazine. Well, Crosby's waiting in the wings, so good night, folks. And remember, just be sure to see your DeSoto Plymouth dealer. <laughs> folks, here's a tip from the National Safety Council. Good drivers don't brag about their ability to get out of tight spots. They stay out of them. This is George Fenneman signing off for the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. That's your old-time radio fix for this week. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Be sure to subscribe to The Chronic Rift on iTunes or visit us frequently at chronicrift.com. What a voice. What a voice. Simply means ink. I think you do. I think you do. Good night, folks. Signing off. Thank you.